Our next panel is the potential of a new America. And like I said earlier, we've got uh, Juan Williams as the, the moderator, Gail Christopher from Kellogg Foundation, uh, Grover Norquist, Derek Smith, and uh, Major General Antonio Taguba. So we're going to have a, a real, another great conversation from a range of perspectives. And in this case, we're not only bringing uh, the, the foundation community who's done some uh, very innovative work, but uh, the, the free market community, the faith community, and then also the veterans world. So it's going to be a, another great, great conversation. So I wanted to put up another uh, um, slide about the survey that we asked ahead of time. And this one is, um, how important are the following factors in helping new Americans reach their potential? And in this one, uh, we saw uh, the biggest uh, the access to higher education came out as the most important uh, in terms of allowing people, allowing new Americans to reach their fullest potential. So this conversation around the potential of a new America will get at not only education issues, but really, again, kind of the, the combination of the social and cultural challenges that we face in this particular conversation. So we got everybody's attention. Thank you very much. Good. And I spared you the bad jokes. So let me introduce uh, a very, another great friend and a, a, a fellow Wizards and Nationals fan. Um, Juan Williams from Fox News uh, has been just a great, not, a, uh, not just a, a speaker and a, a thought leader on this issue, but on a range of issues that are, are confronting our country. So Juan, I really want to thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Ali, thank you very much for that brief introduction. Uh, you could have mentioned I was my high school valedictorian. So what if I was homeschooled, you know? So what? <laughs> and it's uh, been a pleasure to be here this morning to meet so many of you. Who would have guessed this was a Fox News audience? I had no idea. Uh, but welcome to the best panel of the day. If you stick with us, you get a free lunch. And we have a meaty topic for discussion. Immigration, is it a cultural threat or a benefit to the United States. Uh, the panelists will be from major social and cultural institutions, the religious community, the military community, foundation, and the political community. But we're gonna start with words of wisdom from Gail Christopher of Kellogg. Ms. Christopher is Vice President of Policy and a Senior Advisor at W.K. Kellogg, the foundation in Battle Creek, Michigan. She joined them in 2007. She was formerly vice president for program strategy. Ms. Christopher is the author of three books, writes a column for the Federal Times, has been published widely. Please join me in welcoming Gail Christopher. Good morning. I have certainly enjoyed the, the camaraderie. I've certainly enjoyed the opening panel. And I am just impressed with the level of bipartisan, uh, diverse sort of coming together. It, it felt almost like a consensus panel, right? That we must have immigration reform. Who would have expected that? So I think it speaks to the depth of the work and the creativity and the leadership of this organization to get people to move past, if you will, our, our own biases and our own perceptions. I would have disagreed with the outcome of that last um, interaction we had in terms of the, the polling. I believe that perceptions are really critical to they influence behaviors, they influence uh, decisions, they help to shape our values. And so I'm gonna share with you my experience uh, with the Kellogg Foundation in terms of trying to address sort of residual, uh, often unconscious perceptions that are driving our behavior and standing in the way of not just the potential of immigrants, but the potential of this country. This country has always been dealing with the issues of immigration. That is not news. I agree with, with Linda Chavez. This has been a historic dynamic for us. But the elephant in the room then and the elephant in the room now is this belief that was part of our genesis as a nation, a false belief in a hierarchy of human value that some people deserve less opportunity than others. 
How often did we hear the phrase this morning, the anxiety, they call it cultural anxiety, some scholars call it racial and ethnic anxiety, but how often was that anxiety associated with the perception of people who don't look like us? How absurd is that? That our physical characteristics drive our responses to one another. That's old baggage that we as a country cannot carry into the 21st century. So what I suggest and what we've come to believe at, at the Kellogg Foundation is that for America to thrive, America must heal. What does that mean? That means we have to move beyond denial about those dynamics of our culture that have created a hierarchy, if you will, of true opportunity. It's not blame, it's not shame, it's not guilt. It's a fact that we have outgrown a set of beliefs that were at work in our formative eras. We looked at, Mr. Kellogg said, do what you will with his money as long as it helps children. And he wanted us to focus on the most vulnerable children in this country. And there's no debate that most of the children born today in America are children of color. Many are children of immigrants. Many are children of undocumented immigrants. Over 5,000 of them are in the foster care system because of the dramatic increase in our deportation policies over the last two decades. Many of them are very real, very human stories of children not having their parents to bring them up, some even being adopted out of that system. So this idea of diversity and the fact that most of the children in America today are children of color puts a very real and I hope compassion generating face on this discussion but most of those children are being born into low income or impoverished conditions. And so when we talk about immigration, yes, the policy reform around the legal and, and other ways of coming into this country is essential, but the integration, the equalizing or equitable structure of opportunity is just as important. Because we want all of our children to thrive now, I don't have much time, so I'll just tell you that we funded a lot of work in this area of helping America to heal for our children. A lot of our funding has gone into media and communications and perception shaping funding. We also funded community-based organizations to work one-on-one -on -one to help heal divides. And one of the takeaways from the, the work in terms of at community levels was that those communities that were enacting the most xenophobic statutes were communities where, even though the immigrant population was very, very small, that immigrant population was not integrated into the civic structures of those communities. So integrating immediately the immigrant populations into the civic structures of communities is a very important piece of the work. One of the takeaways from the communications work as well as from the research that we funded is that this is the age of brain science and we are discovering that our unconscious beliefs, which are shaped to a large measure by the media that we are exposed to, particularly the stereoty stereotypic images that we embrace on a daily basis. Because we're still a very physically, spatially segregated nation. And so most of our perceptions of the perceived other are shaped by media. But these perceptions get shaped at an unconscious level. And so oftentimes we are reacting, voting, based on those perceptions. So there's a lot of science emerging about how the brain works and this racial anxiety or this anxiety about the other or this cultural anxiety is part of that. 
what's being triggered in us in terms of discomfort. The good news is that there are very specific strategies for addressing that, and we as a nation deserve to do that so that our discussions about critical social issues are not polarizing discussions. They can be discussions that move us to realize not just the potential of the immigrant population, the potential of our nation and our population as a whole, and as Mr. Kellogg would want us to say, to help all of our children realize their full potential. Thank you. Ms. Christopher, thank you very much. Let me introduce our other guests this morning. As I said, we really are blessed to have such smart people with us. To my far left, to your right, Grover Norquist, the president of Americans for Tax Reform. He founded that group in 1985 at the request of President Reagan. The goal of Americans for Tax Reform is to limit the size of government and oppose higher taxes, both at the federal and state level. Next to him is retired Major General Antonio Taguba. He's the winner of the Distinguished Service Medal, Legion of Merit, and Bronze Star. He is now chairman of the Pan-Pacific American Leaders and Mentors Group, president of TDLS Consulting, a business consulting firm for small business owned by disabled veterans and economically disadvantaged veterans. Major General has done tours in South Korea, Germany, Kuwait, uh, participated in Operation Iraqi Freedom, Operation Enduring Freedom, so uh, another spectacular guest. And also with us, Reverend Derek Smith, to my right, the pastor of Kaleidoscope Multi-Ethnic Fellowship and Executive Director of South Carolina Test Prep. Uh, Reverend Smith has a doctorate in uh, Biblical Perspective on Immigration per, uh, Reform, a BS in Math, Chairman of the Board of the Spartanburg City uh, Bible Education. So please help me welcome this very good panel. <laughs> Let me start with Grover. Grover, uh, again, thank you for joining us this morning. Sure. When it comes to so many of the issues that were raised in the first panel, it comes down to a sense of immigrants as not really people who would benefit American society in general, but more along the lines of takers or makers falling in the category of people who would be takers. Uh, if you go back to Mitt Romney's 47%, people who don't pay taxes, people who are somehow parasitic on the society. Does that fit with someone who's concerned about tax reforms that this is a pro-immigrant group, and you yourself are someone who is pro-immigration reform. Sure. I've been active in this field for 30 years, and the criticism back in the 80s was not this makers-takers thing. Uh, when Jack Kemp and Linda Chavez and I and the one person from organized labor that was pro-immigrant, the International Lady Garment Workers Union, would show up. Our opposition was the FLCIO, who opposed immigrants because they would take jobs. Um, I organized a letter in support of allowing Soviet Jews to leave the Soviet Union, and the union groups wouldn't sign it because it might imply we'd let them here. Um, so th the objection was that these people were going to come here and work. Uh, which, of course, is what's happened in our history, and it's been good for the country. This is, Immigration isn't a challenge, it's what makes us work. Uh, I just finished a book on the history of taxation in the United States. When, before we had the revolution, 74, Americans paid one to two percent of their income in taxes. And we had pretty open borders, okay? That, between those two things, we were the lowest, the British, our oppressors, our occupiers, they were paying 20 percent in London. We were paying one to two. They were paying 20 for the privilege of occupying us. And uh, they were thinking about going to three and we took our guns out. Uh, but it was also a question that we were open to lots of people showing up. So this, that's how we grew. It's why we grew. And it's not just an historical thing. You can look into the future. I was in business school in 1980. Japan is number one. The book came out, and uh, all the Japanese students were 
just convinced that they're going to leave us in the dust, and then they forgot to have kids, and they can't do immigration, and the population is going down. China's on the same trajectory. They don't do immigration, and there are lots of people in China, but the work population is actually shrinking. They've got lots of older people, and they're not having one-child policy and everything. They don't do immigration. We can control our growth in a way they can't. <laughs> it's what makes us the future, and people who might want to compete with us for world leadership or being the most powerful guys around, not possible. They're, so immigration is what makes us work. It's, it's what's always, and we've always had all the same problems, all the same problems, all the same criticisms you hear today. We heard when the Germans started showing up in you know, Pennsylvania in the 1600s. Um, the same arguments. They don't speak English. Well, they learned. But in terms of the tax Policy Not the Amish argument. completely, but okay. In terms of the tax argument, uh, that they don't pay taxes or that they're takers, you find that argument one that you can defeat in, the, in that when the conversation is focused on fiscal policy. Well, look, people, the, the immigration is coming to these people come and work, and they pay all sorts of taxes for which, you know, they don't get Social Security benefits because they gave somebody the wrong Social Security number. Uh, people buy this idea that the income tax is the only tax people pay, which you get into some of these numbers. Uh, everyone pays sales taxes. People pay property taxes. They pay all these other taxes through the goods they buy every day. I and mean, taxes are embedded in every product that 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 we buy. And um, you get you buy water, you buy electricity. These things are heavily uh, taxed. So no, the, the, this. This is how we built the country, it's how we're building the country, and it's how we're going to continue to build the country, and if we do it smarter and more, instead of stupider and less, we will outpace our competitors, if you want to view that, the rest of the world in that way, we'll leave them in the dust. All right. We're holding ourselves back. General Taguba, let me move from tax policy to military policy. Military historically played a tremendous role in terms of helping America <coughs> with racial integration. Now, you know, I get emails and calls from people saying, oh, you, can you believe it? They're letting illegal immigrants into our military now. Do you see the military playing a similar role to the one it played in terms of racial integration when it comes to immigration and the wave of immigration now taking place in the United States? I agree with that comment uh, because we've always relied on immigrants to round out our force. Uh, where they have historical roots in that aspect. Uh, when the United States colonized the Philippines, for example, they recruited sailors, the first batch of 10 to 12 back in 1906. Then they started to bring about the, the military, the Philippine scouts and the like, which was trained by the United States. And after the war, some of those folks, like my dad, who was a Bataan Death March survivor, were given the opportunity to become U.S. citizens. Of course, when I asked my father, how did that come about? He says, well, because we had to prove, prove our loyalty to the government with so many thousands of deaths that they said, well, would you like to be a U.S. citizen? That comes about. You know, we've, uh, I've served 34 years in the military uh, as an immigrant, came here, and I come from a family of 200, uh, a family of brothers and cousins and whatever, uh, with a total years of about 225 years on, on, uh, on, on the military. So uh, we've become sort of the model for other immigrants to say, this is a path to citizenship. And uh, the military, of course, is a requirement, an imperative that you have to diversify yourself, not just in terms of demographics, but in terms of specialized skills, uh, in terms of the language capability, the cultural uh, experiences, and whatever have you. Uh, just as an anecdote, when we went to war, uh, when I was deployed, we didn't have enough linguists or translators. Uh, you know, we gave our troops little cards that how to say stop in Arabic. Well, we found out that it takes about two years to, uh, to train someone. So we recruited uh, from Minnesota and just about elsewhere uh, about 600 linguists and translators to help the commanders do their, do their missions in the, uh, out in the field. So I see it as a socioeconomic opportunity. Uh, for immigrants to uh, perform their duty uh, as a way to their path of, of citizenship. So you see it actually as enhancing our military capability Absolutely. to have a more immigrant-friendly force. Right. But now, recently, as I say, there's been controversy about, for example, allowing some of these dreamers to join in the military. Right. 
What do you think? Well, you know, the DREAMers, the DREAMers Act, uh, you can enlist, uh, but you have to be documented. Uh, the president's, the president's uh, new policy today, uh, which is titled uh, uh, the military accessions uh, vital to national interest, uh, was, to, to, was to have a, uh, it was not a pilot test, by the way, was to recruit about 1,500 uh, undocumented immigrants, uh, but they have to go through the rigorous training, the background checks and the like. I mean, it's, some people would say, well, just sign up. No, it, that's not that easy. You have to do back background checks, your educational background and family background. Uh, you have to go to the training. Uh, but those are the highly specialized skills that we need, the doctors, the, uh, the, uh, the language, the, the linguist, uh, healthcare, and the like. Because not everybody wants to join the military, so therefore we go to the immigrant immigration uh, pool to try and entice them to join the military. And you think, by the way, just quickly, that bringing in undocumented people, has there been resistance in the military, or has it worked? No, not at all. We, uh, if, they, if they falsely falsely enlist because they lied on their application, of course, they'll be, they'll be thrown out. But uh, there's, there, what I mean about the socioeconomic opportunity is we want to sustain the force readiness of our military. Uh, we all recognize today that the global conflicts that we're experiencing are evolving. Operational conflicts that, uh, or environment that we have today, short of conflict, is evolving. And uh, our president said that the only indispensable force that we have today is what? The military. Uh, now we're battling Ebola, sending 3,000 troops out there. But if you take a look at the, 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 the composition of those troops, there's immigrants in there. Um, I can tell you about Captain Sean Lin. He goes by Sean, but his real name is Xiao Xiao, but he doesn't want to be called Xiao Xiao. He is a Chinese American, PhD. Uh, he's, uh, he graduated from Georgia Tech, and he's an infectious disease expert. So how do we come about with that? Well, because we want to entice him to join the military as a path to citizenship, and he is a US, citizenship to, US citizen today. That's a great story. Reverend Smith, let me turn to you and ask about something that's cultural. I mean, I have friends in New Orleans who tell me, you know, after Katrina, there's been a wave, an influx of immigrants throughout the South, small communities now, with high percentage of immigrants because of migrant labor and the like. You're in the midst of this conversation in terms of the religious community. Are people more politically aligned or biblically aligned in terms of their reaction to the immigrant? More politically aligned, but that needle is changing. Um, and you said I have a doctorate, but I don't. I, have a, I was in a documentary film addressing <laughs> the biblical uh, call for welcoming the stranger among us. And so, well, you know what? I, I give out doctorate. I'll take it. I'll, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that film, thestrangerfilm.org is the website, but that has played a part, I hope, in, um, in, in moving the needle back toward the biblical uh, mandate. Well, just imagine I'm your audience and you say to me, Juan, you, get it, you need to change your attitude towards the, the stranger among us, the immigrant, because the Bible says what? Well, in Matthew 25, Jesus says, if you don't welcome the stranger among you, uh, that you will be those on his left hand who depart into eternal fire. That's pretty strong. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and this is not a joke for us. If you believe that the Bible is true, this has eternal ramifications. And we will be on the other side of a lot of issues that are politically debated. But people who believe that the Bible is true ought to be pro-immigration reform, and if they're not, I invite you all to tell them to call me. Good for you. But how do you have this conversation when people say, you know, I go down to the gas station, and damn it, there's nobody there who speaks English, or these people are coming in, they don't have our southern traditions. Uh, I would say what you think doesn't matter if you're a follower of Jesus. You, he is to dictate what you are to believe. And uh, it's clear Acts 17 is the place where uh, Paul says in a sermon, from one man God created all the nations, all the families of the earth, and predetermined the times and places where they should live. That means that God ordains human migration, and he always has. 
And Acts 17, 27 says, so that they should seek him, perhaps grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Jesus was an immigrant to Egypt. People who, who dabble in reading scripture don't understand that it's God who is in control. It isn't God who's prompting people to illegally or, or in an undocumented way cross our borders. But once they're here, it is biblically mandated that we welcome them. And do you find that the immigrant is welcomed as a member of the church? Uh, kaleidoscope, multi-ethnic fellowship, we find that. Um, we are an intentionally multi-ethnic Southern Baptist church, believe it or not. At least one of those exists. And um, the tide is turning. Um, Dr. Barrett Duke, who was in, our, um, in this stranger film with us, we haven't met, but hi. Um, <laughs> He, from his vantage, I think, on the ERLC, um, sees this change occurring. And what I would say is that immigration reform, it's a chance for Americans to thrive. It's a chance for students to succeed. I'm also a public high school math teacher. Uh, but immigration, with or without reform, is a chance for Christians to obey Jesus. And that's where my heart is at on this. It's the reason that I'm going to be behind all of y'all, whatever side of whatever aisle you're on, this will happen and it will happen, I hope, a lot because Christians who believe that the Bible is true will begin to obey what the Bible says about this issue. It's not about politics and it's not about policy. It's about people. And on that first thing that said changing cultural perceptions, I wanted the third one to be people. People is what matters. And I could list name after name of folks in my own congregation who day in and day out live in fear, fear, um, just because of driving without a license, you know. It's, I could read texts to you uh, about living in physical danger because they have no way of, uh, of attaining legal status, so. You know, I just wanna ask briefly though, when I think about race and the evangelical community, I think of the evangelical community as overwhelmingly white, uh, and we know historically the churches in our country racially segregated. Uh, but you're telling me that there's an opportunity here that with immigration that maybe we didn't see with the racial divide in our society. I think so. Well, I'll say that the evangelical community is global. It's not American. And it's very much not white, in fact. Um, the average Christian is a teenage woman in uh, Timbuktu literally, on a map if you, if you weighed it all out. That used, it used to be a 50-year-old white man in Germany. Uh, that's no longer true. So uh, evangelical Christianity is thriving. Uh, whether or not it's living or dying in the United States is a different matter. But I'll also say about the takers versus makers, I want to say this, that we all, we all leech off of God's grace and patience, don't we? We're all takers. But there is no manifest destiny for Americans in the kingdom of God. You can tweet that, folks. <laughs> <clears throat> Gail, thank you so much for your opening remarks. Uh, again, I was taken with the idea of, I guess it's Mr. Kellogg's mandate, do whatever you want with our money, but help kids. And if you look at immigrants as disproportionately young people, um, and immigrants as having again, a disproportionately high number of children in American society. Can you understand why some people see immigrants as takers, as a threat, especially at a time of economic uncertainty and anxiety? I can understand why people think the way they do. And as I alluded to in my opening remarks, we've all been kind of programmed to carry certain perceptions and stereotypical responses to the perceived other. Uh, and the only way we overcome those is usually by interaction. That's one of the best ways to overcome them. And I'm so impressed with what you're doing with your church. And the military has shown us that. So I can understand, and I think part of the healing work that our country has to do is being able to understand why people think the way they do, but not let that get in the way of trying to build bridges and to communicate and to cross divides. Well, when it comes to strategy for Kellogg or other foundations, 
we've heard here from people in the political realm, military, religion. So when it comes to the foundations and how you use your money, how can you help people to get beyond that divide that you see? Oh, we are, we are funding organizations. We are funding researchers who are actually developing strategies. One of the most exciting uh, things that's being done right now you know, we tend to, for instance, project Asian American immigrants as model immigrants, when in fact, particularly in California, they face some of the worst disparities in outcomes, particularly with the criminal justice system and the juvenile justice system. And it brings us to a broader issue that our society is dealing with in terms of the disparities within that system and the behaviors, if you will, the automatic responses of police officers. So we're working, our grantees are working by invitation with many major police departments in this country to help them develop the tools and the strategies for examining their behaviors and their responses, particularly when they use lethal force unnecessarily. And so there are, there are ways to, whether it's in the medical profession or the education field or the political field, to get people to, to self-reflect and gain better control over their automatic responses and perhaps negative perceptions of the perceived other. But the doctorate you didn't give me, uh, which I have, is as a holistic, <laughs> is oh, as I, a- I gave it for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Here, you That's can, okay. No, no, no. Uh, As know, a holistic. You know, Jesus works in mysterious I ways. know. His wonders to perceive, I know. Uh, is as a holistic doctor, holistic physician, and the truth of the matter is the human genome and other work shows us that we are all connected, that we are 99% the same, and so much of what we have allowed to be the cultural dominant ethos of America is not based on that. It's based on this perception of difference. In fact, even a hierarchical difference. You know, we are a country of immigrants, Grover, but we are also a country that brought people in by force. And so this very diverse history of ours has a legacy today that shows up in, in major inequalities of opportunity. And so the immigration conversation fits in that conversation. How do we decide what's in the economic best interest of our country, what is truly democracy. When Manuel Pastor talked about opportunity to engage in economy so that we can be participatory citizens and therefore have a stake in, in deciding where our country goes, I think those are the challenges we face in the 21st century. And getting past the immigration debate, getting to immigration conversation, getting to immigration decision and immigration action, you know, that's just a very important step in realizing who we are or could be as a but country. What, what I was getting at in the question, though, was when you look at your peers in the foundation world, right. how are they directing money to help people welcome the immigrant? You know, the, there are about 40 foundations right now that have become part of a coalition that is working on improving opportunities for men and boys of color. Uh, it is an unprecedented collaboration within philanthropy, and it is reflecting a new way of doing business. Uh, any way you look at it, the immigrant population is disproportionately, disproportionately represented in communities that are economically, in some ways, struggling. Now, there are exceptions, and you know, this idea of hard work is real. Nobody probably works harder, actually, than the immigrant population. But the barriers to opportunity that are directly related to policy allows many of, of, of our brothers and sisters to be disproportionately represented in, in terms of economic challenge. So most of the foundations that I know of who, has a, who have a social mission are supporting community-based efforts to improve opportunities for those communities. The ACA, for example, trying to make sure that the language barriers, the, the location barriers were overcome so that people could sign up to get access to health care. Um, the language is a big issue, and many of the foundations have helped to support that. So generally speaking, the philanthropic model in the United States is a charity model, but it's also a capacity building model within communities. So I would think that almost all of our peer foundations are doing something to help give voice 
to communities, particularly those who don't have voice. We funded the um, Drop the I Word campaign. You know, people, Reverend, are not illegal. Amen, sister. And so, you know, th those are the kinds of things that we're funding. But when you say the word advocacy, you know, you set up the divide, right? You know, people who, what did Linda Chavez says, people who earn their living, you know, by fostering the divide. I think you find less of that today in philanthropy. Uh, we fund a table of groups that I was in yesterday, which includes Native American, Asian American, Pacific Islanders, African American, uh, evangelical uh, religious leaders. You know, we are really, I think, as a philanthropic community, trying to bring people together more and spend less time and investment in that which divides us. Let me remind everybody in the audience to take a look at the screens, take out your phones, tablets, your laptops, go to pollev.com -E slash 12020. And uh, there you can select your response to our current question. You can also text your response uh, by using the code that corresponds to your answer to 22333. Let me go back around. Grover, uh, Gail was talking to you a moment ago about the economic issues. I just wanted to hear what you had to say in response. Well, I think the interesting question when people say, oh, immigrants are going to come and change America. Immigrants are the only people in this country who came here on purpose. Uh, most of the guys you went to high school with uh, were born here. They're Americans because their parents were. So it's not a choice uh, for them. Uh, immigrants come here because they want to live here. They, they see something here that they don't see wherever else they were or wherever else they could have gone to. Uh, and I mean, one, it's kind of nice. Everyone keeps telling you, you have the nicest house in town. I want to be at your house. Um, that's cheerful, but it also tells you something about them. Um, and this idea that we should be concerned that they're not like us, they're more like us. Because they chose. They chose to be here. Yeah. You don't think it's an economic imperative that drives people to come? Well, that's part of it. I mean, if you look at the 50 states, there's some, you can, um, How Money Walks is the website you can go to, and they track both people moving and their income moving, because the IRS has all that lovely data on us, uh, between the 50 states. This isn't about immigrants from other countries. It's in the United States. <clears throat> people in the United States leave California, leave New York, move to Texas and Florida, states with no income tax. They move to states with economic growth, with jobs that give you more economic liberty, and they leave states that are highly regulated, highly taxed, and particularly states that spend a lot of money trying to help you. Uh, it's the biggest thing you correlate with. They leave the states that are most trying to help you. Um, so they tell you, that tells you a lot about what people move to and from. It's also true about the United States versus other countries in terms of economic growth and opportunity. Our job is to have economic opportunity here, not just because it's good for immigrants, because it's good for people born here. Most of the people who have challenges in the United States were born here. We need more opportunities for them, not just for immigrants. You know, that's a great argument, uh, because most of the time the argument I hear from the opponents is they're taking our jobs. <laughs> now, people create jobs. Nobody gives you a job. Jo jobs don't exist in some sort of, uh, except perhaps in some make work jobs. Uh, in real jobs, people create the jobs themselves through their, through their work. Their jobs, I got jobs for people who can work and I don't have jobs for people who won't in my own little operation. Right. We can, you know, there's a difference. Do I have a job that any one of 20 people could fill? No but I got jobs that some people could, could certainly do. I mean, economic opportunity and freedom are attractive, one, because people want it, two, because it creates more opportunities. And I mean, one of the challenges I find with some of the people who oppose immigration um, is that they're opposed to every level. You know, the whole H-1B visa of people who come in and clearly are job creators because they have PhDs and they came in from India or you know, computer scientists from Russia and other places and they're going to create jobs that, for themselves and for other people. Silicon Valley's starving for uh, those opportunities. People are forced to go to Canada. Nobody should be forced to do that because they can't <laughs> get into the United States. Uh, it's cold up there, it really is. Um, and we should, those people should be here creating jobs here in all the other things that they do. So th this is a tremendous opportunity, um, but it's part of what we should be doing anyway. And if, look, we're people of the book the Constitution. And if you signed up for that, good. You're good. 
Let me look at here at the uh, response we're getting to the question, which sector of institutions will be most influential in the future debate about immigration? And it's pretty clear here, there's some support for business, but faith is the winner. You agree? <laughs> uh, I think it should be most influential in the future debate. I don't know. Well, it should be. You're, you're kind of guarded here. I mean. You don't think it is? I think there's a lot of people who uh, use the Bible and any number of other holy books for uh, selfish reasons. I mean, it's Jesus who said you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money at the same time. Um, our economy isn't the, the problem. Our faith is the problem. It's in the wrong thing because our faith is in the economy. Um, but what do I know? <laughs> on, on the question of the business committee, in 1999, I was at a meeting at the Republican National Committee, the chairman of the Republican Party was there. The 10 major trade associations in town were there, and, and I was there as the taxpayer guy. And the chairman of the RNC says, what can I do to be helpful? And everybody goes around the table, and they say, take all the trier lawyers and drop them in the river and <laughs> get rid of the capital gains tax. And the same list of things that they always have. That, um, and he gets up to go, thank you very much. Uh, and as he's halfway out the door, like the <clears throat> second to the last scene in the Columbo TV show, well, there's this one other thing. Somebody says, um, I don't know how to bring it up. Well, what is it? Well, we've never worked on it before. What is it? You know, he's, he really wants to go at this point. And he says, well, it's immigration. <clears throat> We're running out of workers, 99. And everybody went around the table, from the truckers to the retail to the restaurant people to the small business to the big, every, yeah, that's actually the biggest problem we have. It dwarfs every other problem that we've just been talk wasting your time for an hour about. But they didn't know how to talk about it. They felt uncomfortable. Isn't, isn't that somebody else's department? Um, so I, would, I think over the last 15 years, the business community has gotten much more active than they were. It's, they're not where they need to be. And the faith communities are, are taking a tremendously strong position and increasingly important position as well, which is why I think if you look at the Republican Party, it's made up of people with jobs that go to church a lot. Um, it, between both of those, we ought to get more Republican elected officials to go, those are my people that see this as important um, and not think that it's some thing outside the conservative, modern, Reagan, Republican Party. Reagan, of course, was very strongly in favor of immigration. Well, uh, again, it's a, this is an interesting poll to me. You know, you see, in fact, Grover, it looks like you're winning converts over to the business argument. Uh, but They're just 15 years late, that's all. 15 years late. But by the way, is it still the case that you think the business community says, we're short on workers, we want more workers? Well, in, in various spots, yes, in, in, the, in the farm industry, in construction, uh, in high tech, you can, you, you, there's some industries see it more right now even with a slow economy. But everybody knows if we start to fix the immigration issue now in X number of years, uh, we will and hopefully we'll be having those growth problems, the problems that come from too much growth, those painful mm. problems. All right, uh, so now we're going to open this up to all of your questions. Uh, please write down your questions, hand it to one of our folks in the room. And while you do that, we are going to do another live poll. Again, please take a look at the screens. Take out your phones, your tablets, your laptops. It's go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash 12020. And uh, there you can select your response. General Chaguba, the, the trailing sector in the right. first <clears throat> poll, the military and law enforcement, mm -hmm. make the case to this group that they're wrong. I think you're wrong, and my <laughs> opinion is this. You know, we, the military today is, represents one half of 1% of the entire population. Just think about that for a moment. 300 million, one half of 1%. But we're all over the world, right, for that matter. And the immigrant, uh, the immigrant side of that, the minority, represents about 5%. If we don't fix immigration today to allow immigrants to join the military because of some limitations, that representation is going to dry up. And then we're going to have to go to other sources um, inside our country to fulfill those shortfalls. Um, and, and that's going to be a dire straits. You know, if, if the military, of course, is, is an element of our national power, and we've been forced to through segregation to equal opportunity to race relations, now diversity, 
and with the Military Leadership Diver uh, Diversity Commission's report is that we are being demanded to, to have, to institutionalize past citizenship. And if we don't allow our immigrants to do that because of some limitations in our immigration policies today, it's gonna be minimized. And I don't think we're going to have, and now that we're going to some budgetary requirements that the military today is gonna shrink uh, because we are very expensive, some would say. But who are the ones that are being deployed today to the point of the spear? And we don't, we don't have, if we don't allow our immigration policies to, to be improved or reformed, um, I would think that, that the 5% will be lessened in, in the future. You know, you said something in telling your personal story that was so compelling to me. It was about your father and becoming an American citizen right. as a matter of loyalty. Do you find that in the immigrant community in the United States, there is an interest in the military, that there is that high degree of patriotism and loyalty to the flag? Uh, obviously, I can talk to stories to that. Um, one case, uh, Brigadier General Viet Long immigrated to this country when he was nine years old. This past June, he is the very first Vietnamese American to achieve the rank of Brigadier General. Mm -hmm. Very first. So we're not about a lot of first. We're a lot about making sure that we role model ourselves to have them interested to join the military as a form of their obligation to be a US citizen. And we've had immigrants that waited over three years and die in combat without gaining their citizenship. There's a lot of them. We, we had, I think, 111 that died that were granted their citizenship posthumously. Um, and some of them were married. So how does that all equate out in terms of loyalty, uh, doing your obligation to, to answer the call to duty and serve your country? Anybody else want to jump in on that one? I can attest to the fact that it's true. Uh, elder in our church, John Appleby, his mom left him in Colombia with his aunts. Um, she then got her status here, requested him to come after seven years. He joined the United States Marine Corps and served uh, with honor. And now he's a father of three girls and um, he's the, and he works for the social security uh, office in our hometown. So he's as American as apple pie. <laughs> I, w I would just say, I, I certainly concur, and that's a historic phenomenon that we don't know enough about in terms of the roles of immigrants and diverse people in our military, in every war, you know. But those stories are not told, and they're not shared, and they're not understood. But even on the business question, I think about a third of the small businesses in this country are created by immigrants and immigrant families. Uh, the level of contribution to the GDP continues to go up and up and up. I mean, we, I like, well, I don't wanna get ahead of you, but um, in terms of us perceiving inaccurately the contributions of many, many groups, and that's part of our work, you know, that other category on the slide there in terms of what serves as barriers. Some of that is political, some of it is policy, you know, definitely that, but another big piece of it is our perceptions, our misperceptions of one another and our values as human beings. So okay. military, business, all of the above. All right, we're out of time, but let me just say here uh, two things. One, I'm gonna take a few questions from Ali, but. Let me just announce the results of this last poll, which the question was, what blocks hinders immigrants from reaching their fullest potential, lack of, and the winner here, this is no question, is other. Now, I don't know what that means. Uh, how, how would you interpret that? Status. Status? So. Reform, <laughs> politics, and perception, for sure. What would you guys say? The high capital gains tax. <laughs> I thought so. That was it, man. Oh, gosh, I'm glad you're here, Grover. Uh, okay, here's a question, and we're going to have no time, so I'm just going to ask anybody, one person to each question. In a 2008 study, we found that Hispanics living in the United States trusted the following institutions ranked least trustworthy to most trustworthy, and uh, so most trustworthy was Univision, uh, least trustworthy, the Republican Party. Um, and in between, you know, most trustworthy, so Univision, U.S. government, Catholic Church, then on the least trustworthy side, Democratic Party, Mexican government, and Republican Party. Who wants to respond to that? 
How does a Republican <laughs> well, change I, that perception? Well, by talking to people, by reaching out and making it clear um, that we're the country, we're a country of immigrants and of immigration ongoing, not just we were immigrants, but we are immigrants and will be. Uh, the Republican Party has a lot of work to do because there are a handful of very loud voices which don't represent the whole party, but uh, if you watch Univision, you think they do. Um, Tom Tancredo is very famous in the Hispanic community. Yeah. He's not in the rest of the country, but in, there, yeah. Uh, and that can be very destructive. So I think other Republicans who uh, want to reach out and have everybody included in the, moder in the country and in the modern Republican Party need to be louder voices, n and not just say, well, I'm good on this stuff. They need to be as loud as some of the guys who are destructive. The next question, do we have more difficulty welcoming the stranger in this nation than other advanced countries? Are there models of particular success or failure elsewhere? I think we do it best, but not well enough. Oh, I can't I, think of another country that does a better job. Right, I was gonna say, I mean, this phenomenon of xenophobia or, or the in-group, the out-group, or, or hating the other, it's a global phenomenon. So I don't think other countries are doing it a lot better than we are. I'm gonna go back to the, uh, the first question that you asked in terms of Univision being the most trusted. It speaks to the power of images, and particularly almost a, a bombardment of images and ideas affecting our consciousness. And we have got to wake up about that as a country and realize what in fact is shaping our behaviors and be more intelligent about how that's managed. Uh, so the fact that Univision is the most trusted or that the, you had those great disparities in terms of the Fox News, you could probably say the same thing about MSNBC. You know, we're, we're creating uh, media bombardments, if you will, that are affecting our brains consciously and unconsciously and how we are responding to one another as human beings. And we gotta, not only does the Republican Party have to do some work, we have to do some work on that as a country. Pastor Smith, you see models in other countries in terms of how they respond? Uh, my answer to the question was no. I think we're as good as any. Well, let me just add to that. Uh, I think it's a matter of education, and sometimes we'll forget we just, you know, it has to be on a continued education. Uh, you know, I've been in this country now for almost 54 years, and just the other day, uh, filling out an application for an ID card, uh, the lady behind the counter asked me, since I was not born in the United States, I have to bring in my naturalization papers and a, and a passport. And I just found that rather, I wasn't mad at her, she was just doing her job. But it's how the application was formed, that if you are not born, you have to prove yourself. Now mind you, I've been a volunteer at the USO for like five years now, and I was just renewing my ID card. And I <laughs> put it, that made a copy five years ago to say, okay, it's a Guba, it's a US citizen. But other than that, I think they were not well informed. So we do try hard. Yeah, I, uh, I, so it kind of propagates itself if we don't try hard and then we don't educate our children for that matter because they're going to be the beneficiary of this issue. Absolutely. In the long run. Self criticism is, and, and self awareness is useful and helpful to keep going. Um, I do think we should say, look, here are all the problems we have on immigration policy. We do do it better than any other country I can think of. I'm sure many countries do some things in it better than we do, but the whole package, we've done it better, longer than, uh, than anybody else. That doesn't mean it's okay. It doesn't mean we've done enough and we can rest on our laurels. You go through all the great empires of the world, all the great city-states as they were growing, Carthage, Rome, Baghdad, you know, when they were growing, they were they were where immigrants went. They were the immigrant-friendly areas. It's when people cut that off that you stop having success. Or people quit coming because they don't think you're successful anymore. Well, I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, do you want to give me 10 minutes for more questions? Really? You want, but these people are hungry. Well, anyway, you want 10 minutes more 10 questions? Minutes. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you another well, question. One, I Go was going to say one thing about Univision, is, as far as I know, it's broadcast in Spanish. Isn't that yes, true? absolutely. And so, Perfect. so much of the, the loyalty or the trust um, comes from hearing things in your heart language, the mother, the, your mother tongue, the language that your mother spoke to you, I think. And uh, that's true not merely for Hispanic uh, people, but for anyone from anywhere. And it's the reason that I think... Learning English in, a, in an environment where your 
ethnic identity is, is appreciated and welcomed is so important. And my own mother-in-law, Norma Blanton, started an ESOL, or English for Speakers of Other Languages program in our, at Arcadia Elementary School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. She's volunteering to do that. If you want to fund it, give her a call. Um, but they have over 120 adults coming twice a week, bringing hundreds of their kids who are being uh, seen, volunteer, uh, child, free child care. They have Spanish-speaking teachers. My wife is among them. And uh, they're teaching English to people who are hungry to learn it because they want to be a part of our nation. They want to be a part of our economy. They want to be a part of our churches. And if you think 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, the debate was we shouldn't have ESL classes, right? You know, we've moved beyond that. But even to the point where the research is now showing that the bilingual child the child who does speak more than one language mm -hmm. learns at a much faster pace right. in all subject areas. You know, for those of us who are getting older and we're worried about, you know, brain loss. Okay, uh, we need to speak other language. You know, you know, this idea of bilingual language and and encouraging that is universally helpful. I think America is one of the few places in the world where we think that one language is all we need to speak. Uh, and it's, it's no question that it's to our advantage to become more flexible, more diverse, and certainly more inclusive. Okay, so another question is, business is so important because most of the information and fear is economic and in basis. So what can American business do better to move the needle among regular folks. Now let me say, we're in Washington and the Chamber of Commerce is pretty strong in backing immigration reform. It's, you know, the Steve Kings and Tom Tancredos on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the business community can do about it because they, they still back the Republican Party. No, I think, well, they're obviously working with the vast majority of the Republicans that are open to immigration reform. The challenge we had in 2007, and it was, Ronald Reagan did tax immigration reform in 86, and it was George uh, W. Bush who put it forward in 2007. The sad story there was killed by the FLCIO with a letter, Bob Novak wrote about this, carried into the meeting to kill the thing, carried by Barack Obama. This is dead, this is over, because the AFL didn't want a guest worker program as part of it. So um, the modern Republican Party's actually been there with, um, but you do have, annoying voices that I think um, are unhelpful, uh, but it was the AFL-CIO that killed it in 2007. The business community needs to be a louder voice and have more political oomph than the AFL does, which right now has been able to control. Look, Democrats had the House Senate presidency for two years, all of 2009, all of 2010. They did nothing, okay? So this idea that somehow the Democrats have some secret wish to do immigration reform and somebody's holding them back is nonsense. They could have done it like this, um, and I, but they didn't. The FLCI has the reason until they get past that and figure out how to deal with it. They become a boat anchor on fixing it. It's going to have to be a Republican-led fight, which is why I think a Republican House and Senate is going to be necessary. It may take a Republican president as well. We were almost there with Bush, but the Senate took 60 votes. The union said no. Well, talk radio said no in a big way. Yeah, yeah but that wasn't, talk... that wasn't what killed it in this town. Yeah. I think well, talk radio had a tremendous political effect. Well, I'll yeah. say I met with Lindsey Graham last week at Tommy's Country Ham in Greenville, <laughs> South Carolina. That's a real place. Look it up. And he was sharing with a group of pastors who uh, were all white and evangelical, I believe, that he knows the political numbers and that if we're going to win the Senate, we, I'm a Republican, sorry. I don't know if you're supposed to know that. Um, <laughs> if we win the Senate and the White House, then it could happen. But it sort of needs to happen before that. Well, that I true? have to say that business doesn't need to be louder. They need to be smarter. And they need to make a much stronger business and economic case for not just the law to pass, but the full integration mm -hmm. and the economic viability of these communities. It, I mean, I agree with Manuel Pasteur. It's going to happen, you know, it really, and I'm going to do what Ali asked me to do and not be partisan. It's very difficult, but not be partisan. But the fact of the matter is the business community has tremendous power in this country if they come together and use that power in very strategic and, and critical ways right now that transcend the partisan divide. I mean, I think businesses 
Louder, we've got enough loud, you know, in the talk voice, talk radio voices. We really need smart, strategic, strong business cases that are made that cannot be denied by either party to move this conversation but, forward. When I was saying loud, I didn't mean more decibels. Okay. But um, the guys from the business community, the Fortune 500 people, the small business community, they should be on those yeah. talk radio shows. Yeah. Um, because those were the voices that, frankly, in 2007 weren't being heard on talk radio. And some politicians got a skewed view of where, where people are. Uh, but at the end of the day, the polling actually continues to be there for uh, immigration reform, even though you have the screaming from time to time. You mean the polling among Republicans? Republicans, yeah. Uh, Republicans and the, and the country as a whole, but Republicans as well. All right. I'm going to call it if you guys aren't. So I want to say thank you so much to Gail Christopher, to Reverend Derek Norris, to Major General Antonio Taguba, and to Grover Norquist. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us today.